Thanks for listening to VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear two reports from John Russell. Faith Perlow is here to answer a new question from an English learner from Ukraine. We close with part three of the American story, The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. But first, an area of western China may have the highest known imprisonment rate in the world. The area is called Kona Sheher County. It is in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Nearly one in 25 people in the county has been sentenced to prison on terrorism-related charges. Most of the county's population is Uyghur, a mainly Muslim Turkic ethnic minority. Reporters with the Associated Press received and examined a list with the names of more than 10,000 Uyghurs sent to prison in Kona Sheher. A Xinjiang expert received the list from an unnamed source. The source is a self-described member of China's Han Chinese majority opposed to the Chinese government's policies in Xinjiang. The list was passed to the AP by Abdueli Ayub, a Uyghur language specialist living in exile in Norway. The AP confirmed the list through talks with eight Uyghurs who recognized 194 people on the list. The AP also examined legal notices, recordings of phone calls with Chinese officials, and checks of addresses, birthdays, and identity numbers. In recent years, China has carried out a severe crackdown on the Uyghurs, which it has described as a war on terror. The list represents the size of China's government campaign that has sent a million or more people to internment camps and prisons. The list also confirms what families and rights groups have said for years. China is depending on a system of long-term imprisonment to sharply control Uyghurs. Following strong international criticism, Chinese officials in 2019 announced the closure of short-term internment camps where Uyghurs were detained without charges. However, Thousands of Uyghurs remain in prison for years on what experts say are false charges of terrorism. Uyghur farmer Rosikari Tohti was known as a soft-spoken, family-loving father of three children. He had little interest in religion. His cousin, Mihragul Musa, was shocked to discover Tohti had been kept in prison for five years for religious extremism. Never did I think he would be arrested, said Musa, who now lives in exile in Norway. If you saw him, you would feel the same way. From the list, Musa found out Tohti's younger brother, Ablikim Tohti, also was sentenced to seven years on charges of gathering the public to disturb social order. Tohti's next-door neighbor, a farmer called Nurmamet Daoud, was sentenced to eleven years on the same charges. The prison sentences across Kona Sheher County were for two to twenty-five years, with an average of nine years, the list shows. The list offers the widest and most detailed look yet at who is in prison in Xinjiang. 
it does not include people with usual criminal charges. Rather, it centers on offenses related to terrorism, religious extremism, or unclear charges traditionally used against political dissidents. This means the true number of people imprisoned is very likely higher. But even at a low estimate, Kona Shaher County's imprisonment rate is more than ten times higher than that of the United States. It is also more than thirty times higher than the rates in China as a whole. Darren Byler is an expert on Xinjiang's mass imprisonment system. He said most arrests were outside the law, with people detained for having family members overseas or for downloading certain cell phone applications. It is really remarkable, Byler said. In no other location have we seen entire populations of people be described as terrorists or seen as terrorists. China has struggled for years to control Xinjiang, where Uyghurs have long disliked the government's heavy-handed rule. After the September 11th terrorist attacks in the United States, Chinese officials began using terrorism as an excuse to justify extreme controls. The crackdown strengthened in 2017, after a series of knife attacks and bombings carried out by a small number of Uyghur militants. The Chinese government defended the mass detentions as both lawful and necessary to fight terrorism. In 2019, Xinjiang officials declared the short-term detention camps had closed. They said that everyone they had described as trainees had graduated. Visits by Associated Press reporters to four former camp sites confirmed that they were shut down or turned into other kinds of centers. But as the camps closed, the prisons expanded. At least a few camps were turned into centers for incarceration. Some charges for prisoners on the list are new and special to Xinjiang, such as preparing to carry out terrorism. The charge was newly defined in 2016. Abdulwali Ayoub the Uyghur exile who passed the list to the AP has closely documented the ongoing repression of his community. But this list shocked him. On it were his neighbors, a cousin, and one of his high school teachers, Adil Tursun. Ayub said Tursun was the only one in his high school who could teach Uyghur students in Chinese. Every year, the students from his class had the best chemistry test scores in the town. He was a Communist Party member and considered a model Uyghur by the government. The names of the crimes, spreading extremist thoughts, separatism, these charges are absurd, Ayub said. Ayub sent out the list among Uyghurs living overseas to ask people for names of those they recognized. Only eight out of thirty agreed to speak publicly. Ayub wished more had agreed to speak out, but he remains focused on documenting the lockdown of his people. We will win at the end, because we are on the side of justice, he said. We are on the right side of history. I'm John Russell. And I'm Ashley Thompson. The music group Coldplay plans to use their fans' energy to help provide power for their musical performances and to help the environment. The band has promised to use methods that are sustainable. This includes using energy that does not add carbon gases to the atmosphere. 
the band hopes to cut the amount of carbon dioxide, or CO2, released by its business activities by 50%. The music stars have added special dance floors and energy-storing exercise bicycles to their latest world tour. The goal is to get fans to help power the show as they dance or spin by producing electricity. Bassist Guy Berryman suggested music fans will be more likely to accept changes to the concert experience if it is a kind of opportunity to do something fun. Each special dance floor, called a kinetic dance floor, can support many people. The floor creates electricity when people move on it. The band even has competitions before its performances to find out which group of fans can create the most power. Each of the bikes can create an average of 200 watts of energy, captured in batteries that run parts of the show. Being green is a good business model. That's what we'd like to show, said Coldplay lead singer Chris Martin. Coldplay is just one music act working to reduce the effects of its tour on the Earth's climate. Other famous musicians and bands are also taking such steps, including Billie Eilish, Harry Styles, The Lumineers, Dave Matthews Band, Shawn Mendes, Maroon 5, John Mayer, Lord, The Chicks, and The 1975. The music artists are part of an effort by the entertainment industry, from sports teams to toy manufacturers, to reduce carbon gas emissions. Adam Gardner is with Reverb, a non-profit group that helps bands make their concerts better for the environment. He is not involved with Coldplay's tour. But Gardner said, The relationship that musicians have with millions of their fans is unlike any other relationship of any other public figure. It can be a walking, talking example. Musicians are providing more plant-based food choices. They are not using single-use plastic containers. And they are trying to change the transportation they and their fans use. Eilish has promised to eliminate an estimated 35,000 single-use water bottles from her tour. She also only serves vegetarian food, or food without meat, backstage. The band Massive Attack is traveling by train. Sean Mendez has promised to reduce his tour's effects on the environment and cut emissions by 50% for each show. He says he will use sustainable materials in tour clothing, stay at hotels that promise to cut emissions, and not use single-use plastic. He has even promised to use sustainable aircraft fuel. Coldplay has taken other steps to reduce the environmental effects of its tour. The music of the Sphere's tour stage uses recycled steel, the band hopes to deploy the world's first tour battery system, made from 40 repurposed BMW electric car batteries. The hope is to power the entire show with batteries. We are very blessed that we have the resources to be able to do it because it's very expensive to try these things for the first time, said Martin. We're so privileged that we're in a position where we can change. I'm John Russell. week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Yevgen from Ukraine about the use of I beg to differ and disagreement expressions in American English. 
Hello, everybody. I would like to know the best disagreeing phrases. How common is the phrase "I beg to differ" in American English? Best regards, Yevgen from Ukraine. Dear Yevgen, thank you for your question. The expression "I beg to differ" is not commonly used in American English. This British English expression of disagreement is quite formal and extremely polite. We have several expressions in American English for disagreement. Some are more formal and polite than others. We will take a closer look at a few of those expressions today. You can use these basic statements for disagreeing: either "I disagree" or "I do not agree." However, sometimes these statements are too strong for certain conversations. If we disagree with someone in a formal setting or over a sensitive issue such as politics or beliefs, we sometimes add the following phrases before our basic messages. I am afraid I disagree. I see your point, but I do not agree. I understand what you are saying, but I disagree. These expressions are used to hedge or soften what we say. They are used like a barrier. Think of a green bush that surrounds a garden or house to help protect the receiver of the message. Hedging expressions let the writer or speaker say what they want to say less directly or politely. When we speak to a close friend or family member, we often use less formal hedge expressions. For example, Speaker A. What time should we wake up? Our flight leaves at nine thirty in the morning. Speaker B. We should wake up at four a.m. to arrive at the airport by six a.m. Speaker A. Well, I don't think so. We will be waiting for a long time. In this example, Speaker B uses the word "well" to hedge or soften the sentence, and "I don't think so" to disagree. This informal expression of disagreement is acceptable since the speakers are close and familiar with each other. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Yevgen. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews dot com, and that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlo. The Fall of the House of Usher, Part Three. I was visiting an old friend of mine, Roderick Usher, in his old stone house, his palace, where a feeling of death hung on the air. I saw how fear was pressing on his heart and mind. Now his only sister, the Lady Madeline, had died, and we had put her body in its resting place. In a room inside the cold walls of the palace, a damp, dark vault, a fearful place. As we looked down upon her face, I saw that there was a strong likeness between the two. Indeed, said Usher, we were born on the same day, and the tie between us has always been strong. We did not long look down at her, for fear and wonder filled our hearts. There was still a little color in her face, and there seemed to be a smile on her lips. We closed the heavy iron door and returned to the rooms above, which were hardly less gloomy than the vault. 
And now a change came in the sickness of my friend's mind. He went from room to room in a hurried step. His face was, if possible, whiter and more ghastly than before, and the light in his eyes had gone. The trembling in his voice seemed to show the greatest fear. At times he sat looking at nothing for hours, as if listening to some sound I could not hear. I felt his condition slowly, but certainly, gaining power over me. I felt that his wild ideas were becoming fixed in my own mind. As I was going to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day after we placed the Lady Madeline within the vault, I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep did not come. While the hours passed, my mind fought against the nervousness. I tried to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the gloomy room, to the dark wall coverings which in a rising wind moved on the walls. But my efforts were useless. A trembling I, I could not stop filled my body, and fear without reason caught my heart. I, I sat up, looking into the darkness of my own room, listening. I do not know why to certain low sounds which came when the storm was quiet. A feeling of horror lay upon me like a heavy weight. I put on my clothes and began walking nervously around the room. I'd been walking for a very short time when I heard a light step coming toward my door. I knew it was Usher. In a moment I saw him at my door, as usual, very white, but there was a wild laugh in his eyes. Even so, I was glad to have his company. And have you not seen it? He said. He hurried to one of the windows and opened it to the storm. The force of the entering wind nearly lifted us from our feet. It was indeed a stormy but beautiful night and wildly strange. The heavy, low-hanging clouds which seemed to press down upon the house flew from all directions against each other, always returning and never passing away in the distance. With their great thickness they cut off all light from the moon and the stars, but we could see them because they were lighted from below by the air itself which we could see rising from the dark lake and from the stones of the house itself. You must not, you shall not look at this, I said to Usher as I led him from the window to a seat. This appearance, which surprises you so, has been seen in other places, too. Perhaps the lake is the cause. Let us close this window. The air is cold. Here is one of the stories you like best. I will read, and you shall listen, and thus we will live through this fearful night together. The old book which I had picked up was one written by a fool, for fools to read. And it was not, in truth, one that Usher liked. It was, however, the only one within easy reach. He seemed to listen quietly. Then I came to a part of the story in which a man, a strong man, full of wine, begins to break down a door, and the sound of the dry wood as it breaks can be heard through all the forest around him. Here I stopped for it seemed to me that from some very distant part of the house sounds came to my ears like those of which I had been reading. It must have been this likeness that had made me notice them, for the sounds themselves, with the storm still increasing, were nothing to stop or interest me. I continued the story, and read how the man, now entering through the broken door, discovers a strange and terrible animal of the kind so often found in these old stories. He strikes it and it falls with such a cry that he has to close his ears with his hands. Here again 
I stopped. There could be no doubt this time I did hear a distant sound. Very much like the cry of an animal in the story, I... I tried to control myself so that my friend would see nothing of what I felt. I was not certain that he had heard the sound, although he had clearly changed in some way. He had slowly moved his chair so that I could not see him well. I did see that his lips were moving as if he were speaking to himself. His head had dropped forward, but I knew he was not asleep, for his eyes were open and he was moving his body from side to side. I began reading again and quickly came to a part of the story where a heavy piece of iron falls on a stone floor with a ringing sound. These words had just passed my lips when I heard clearly, but from far away, a loud ringing sound, as if something of iron had indeed fallen heavily upon a stone floor, or as if an iron door had closed. I lost control of myself completely and jumped up from my chair. Usher still sat moving a little from side to side. His eyes were turned to the floor. I rushed to his chair. As I placed my hand on his shoulder, I felt that his whole body was trembling. A sickly smile touched his lips. He spoke in a low, quick, and nervous voice as if he did not know I was there. Yes, he said. I heard it. Many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. But I did not dare to speak. We have put her living in the vault. Did I not say that my senses were too strong? I heard her first movements many days ago, yet I did not dare to speak. And now, that story. But the sounds were hers. Oh, where shall I run? She is coming, coming to ask why I put her there too soon. I hear her footsteps on the stairs. I hear the heavy beating of her heart. Here he jumped up and cried as if he were giving up his soul. I tell you, she now stands at the door! The great door to which he was pointing now slowly opened. It was the work of the rushing wind, perhaps, but no. Outside that door a shape did stand the tall figure in its grave clothes of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white dress, and the signs of her terrible efforts to escape were upon every part of her thin form. For a moment she remained trembling at the door. Then with a low cry she fell heavily in upon her brother. In her pain as she died at last, she carried him down with her, down to the floor. He, too, was dead, killed by his own fear. I rushed from the room. I rushed from the house. I ran. The storm was around me in all its strength as I crossed the bridge. Suddenly a wild light moved along the ground at my feet, and I turned to see where it could have come from, for only the great house and its darkness were behind me. The light was that of the full moon of a blood-red moon, which was now shining through that break in the front wall, that crack which I thought I had seen when I first saw the palace. Then only a little crack. It now widened as I watched. A strong wind came rushing over me. The whole face of the moon appeared. I saw the great walls falling apart. There was a long and stormy shouting sound. And the deep black lake closed darkly over all that remained of the House of Usher. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 